Hi, hello. Um, I'm Christine Love. I'm the founder of Love Conquers All Games. Uh, I've been developing visual novels uh, as a hobby since 2007, and this has been my full-time job since uh, 2012, when we released Analog A Hate Story, which was actually the first visual novel to be released on Steam. Uh, now there's a lot more, but that was the first. Um, more recently, we just released Lady Killer in a Bind, um, which is an erotic romantic comedy about cross-dressing, social manipulation, and the most important part, lots of explicit kinky lesbian sex. Uh, we're, sorry, that's the slide that was supposed to go there. Uh, we're a small three-person team at the core. I do writing, programming, design. Uh, we have Isaac, who's a musician, and there's Friday, who does art. Um, did a lot of the character concepts, uh, a lot of uh, the process is sort of a collaboration with him. Uh, he was also the art lead. We had a bunch of uh, art assistants for background and other small stuff, but the core team, the bulk of the work, was done by just these three people. So uh, we're not a very big team, and nothing I talk about right now is going to be anything huge or anything that you can't do with a small team. Uh, this is going to be a little broad, a little bit rambly, but I'd like to cover some of the biggest philosophical lessons about design we've learned in the past half decade. Uh, I'm going to present these as being hard rules. We sort of approach them as hard rules. It isn't to say you have to follow them, but like if you don't, um, I'd at least consider like why you're not working this way. Um, and like really, the purpose of having a rule is to consider why you're going to break it. Uh, in my opinion, What's most important about a visual novel is providing an immersive experience that the player feels like they're part of. Unlike traditional prose, um, visual novels have the power to put the career directly into the story. Um, and here's how we do that. If interaction is the most important feature of playing a visual novel, and I think it is, uh, you have to treat it like that while writing. Don't fall into the trap of writing out one single branch, then going back and adding choices later. Uh, you can always tell when the writer has done that. I feel like you need to be considering your choices and your interactions immediately. One of the biggest problems in games that have choices is if there's too few, like if it takes an hour to get to the first choice, uh, the player will get really restless and be going like, okay, okay, but when can I click on, on, on the thing to say? And, you know, it makes them impatiently skip over your amazing introduction. It's really bad if the player is feeling restless for extended periods of time. They'll start skimming, they'll lose focus. But if you time out your choices regularly, you can build on that anticipation instead. So you can turn it into an anticipation of, oh, when's the next beat going to come? When is... When do I get to say something? And you can sort of structure things around that. So in our games, every time the protagonist takes any sort of major action, we always make the result of a player choice, no matter what. Originally, this was uh, from a narrative restriction in Analog, which um, if you haven't played that, uh, the way it works is that you're sort of talking to a girl inside a computer, and you don't actually have any lines of dialogue like no spoken dialogue, no narration, so in order to communicate with one of the characters, it has to come from a choice. You had to click on a choice, otherwise she just wouldn't know what you're saying. Um, we realized this worked really, really well, so, and, you know, like made the player feel like they're a part of the story, so we continued with that with our choices moving forward. Uh, this doesn't mean the protagonist has to be a blank slate, nor does it mean that you have to make it so you have the choice of doing anything, which I think is a thing you see in like a lot of, you know, Western RPGs, like that sort of approach. The idea that, you know, every single possible option must be available. You can still have a protagonist that has like their own unique character. Um, in Lady Killer with the Beast, she has a defined character. Um, but there still isn't just one correct choice. There's still like different ways she can approach a problem within her character. Um, so don't worry about, you know, making every single possible approach, just the ones that you think make sense. Uh, what's important is that 
players will remember the actions that they take. That's like the really important thing. So if you have something that's really supposed to be an important thing to your story, it's always going to be those choices. Um, up on screen right now is we actually sort of have a, this was inspired by Telltale Games. Is a, They track stats, so we do that too, and at the end of the game um, it shows what everyone picked, and you can sort of compare your notes. And as you can see on this screen, there's actually like a lot of variants, like um, none of these choices are too much over 50%, so most players actually did like pick different things. So it doesn't feel like there's ever just one correct thing. And, you know, players like comparing notes. The actions are going to be the things that people talk about. Um, as you can see by the fact that this person posted theirs on the Steam uh, community hub. So if you have something that the protagonist does, like a, an action that's supposed to be major important, that's supposed to be big, and you want it to feel important, you need to present it as a player choice. That way you can trick the player into feeling like they did something special. You never want your important story to feel like, oh, well, I didn't want the character to do that, but the story forced me to, so, well, I guess that's just what the writer wanted. Another thing that's best avoided is having an obvious correct choice. Uh, that's boring. Players can see through that. I feel like this is very common in visual novels where, you know, it turns into a guessing game of, oh, what does this character want me to say? I think generally uh, it's more interesting to have different approaches that can have different results. So your conversations turn into, well, I know that character is going to respond well to me saying one of these two or three or four things. Which one of these is the approach that I want rather than, oh, well, how do I pander to this character? Um, but yeah, like generally don't have an obvious correct choice. Uh, it's boring. Players can see through it. We do it very sparingly. Obviously, I have on screen an example of us doing that. Um, we do it sparingly because sometimes there's an important action that the protagonist needs to take. But there's only one way it can play out, and you want the player to feel special for doing the right thing. Uh, so, for example, we have the seven minutes in heaven sequence, and we want the player to feel special for saying yes. They're obviously going to say yes. There's no way they're going to skip the entire scene. But we do tease at, you know, there would be a reward if you said no. I know you're not going to, but there would have been a reward. Um, Still, I don't like these. We refer to them as fake choices. In Lady Killer, over the course of about 20-ish hours of gameplay, we have maybe five of these all told. Uh, we try to be sparing with them. They're really hard to write for. Save them when they're absolutely necessary. Otherwise, you should think about how you can provide alternate, equally valid approaches instead. If the player feels like most of their choices are guess the right thing to say, they're not going to feel like their choices, you know, actually matter. Um, okay, so that's all good, but how do you actually write for that? Lady Killer Divine has a little over 900 unique dialogue choices, um, which is a lot. How do you make a branching narrative that has lots of choices and also stay sane? There's basically two ways to approach writing choices. Say you have three choices, followed by another three choices, followed by another three choices. How many branches do you have to write? The obvious answer is three times three times three, which is 27, and please, for the love of God, do not do this. It's impossible. You absolutely cannot. Don't like let things get out of control like that. Don't waste your time. Um, this chart is from, I'm not sure whose Kickstarter is from. It's from someone's. Um, if it's yours, I deeply apologize, but it's the pinnacle of absolutely what not to do. You can just see these, you know, these branches go off into infinity forever. And if you do something like this, you're going to waste extraordinary amounts of time writing content that nobody is going to see. Please, just don't, please don't do that. The correct answer to, if you have three choices, then another three choices, then another three choices, how many branches of that? It's nine. Um, you have a branch for each of those choices. Just please avoid exponential growth. Instead, track stats on what choices players make. 
it doesn't have to be on every single choice. If you track enough important ones, players won't actually know which ones are important. So let's assume that everyone could be important. A thing to remember is that storytelling isn't about what you're writing. It's what's occurring between the screen and the player. It's what they think they're experiencing. The most important thing is what you've actually done. That doesn't, what you've actually done isn't what's important. It's what the player believes you've done. So in Lady Killer, we have over 900 choices, but we only track about 300 stats. So right off the bat, only a third of your choices will actually like have any sort of variable impact whatsoever. That doesn't mean they don't matter because they affect the way the player believes the story has occurred. They think in their version of the story, they pick that choice. Even if the writing doesn't, you know, ever adjust to that, that's still a part of the narrative that they've constructed in their head. So just off the bat, that has a huge impact. Um, so they make a difference, but they don't affect the amount of writing that has to be done if there's a choice that has no variables to it. Um, that said, there's still 300 different stats, so a lot of these will only affect a single line of dialogue. You do something, and then later, when it's relevant to the conversation, there'll be a callback to it. They'll say, oh, remember that time we played Seven Minutes in Heaven, for example. Um, some of these will cause different dialogue options to become available in other scenes. So you said something once, and that gives you options later. Or you don't say something, and then that choice is locked. And, you and the player realizes, oh, well, my choices must matter if the way things are now has been affected by things before. Um, very, very few of these will cause an entire scene to be read differently. We'll just straight up have like an alternate opening, like just like a thousand unique words that you only see if you did a scene a certain way, and then there's an alternate version if you did it another way. Um, we do this based on like, for example, what character route you're on. Uh, if you see one character while you're on their best friend's route, that's very different from, you know, seeing their route otherwise. So we sometimes do that, um, do it sparingly because, you know, it takes a lot of resources. But the point is not every choice needs to have the same weight. Um, if you have a lot of different weights, players will approach your choices as being meaningful. From there, we can figure out how to structure the game. So in Lady Killer, each scene is composed of roughly uh, three to five story beats. And every story beat roughly corresponds to a single set of choices. So um, when we have three story beats in a scene, we generally follow a three act structure. The first choice is unimportant, but it sets the tone. The second choice introduces stakes. The third choice resolves what the scene is about. Um, if it's five beats, then we slightly modify that. But you know, the, the whole point is to think about what this means in terms of your structure. From there, we have a larger structure. For example, a character's story arc might be composed of five scenes. And each of those five scenes is about exactly one thing. And that one thing is the thing that's resolved in the final story beat of that scene. Uh, these numbers aren't important, so don't worry too much about them. They're just what worked for us. The important thing is that you're thinking of the structure of your game as having the choice as a base unit. So uh, let's return to our hypothetical set of three choices. How do you write that? In any scene, you're going to have one specific goal in mind. It's the direction that the scene is going in. Sometimes you'll come up with the choices first. Other times you'll have a long block of unbranching text, and you just need to break it up. Uh, in Lady Killer, each choice's branch was around 200 words. They're not long. Once you've written your three choices, have them fold back into the main trunk as soon as possible, just as quickly as you possibly can. Remember, as long as the transition is natural, the players won't know how long each branch is. So there's no point spending too much time on it. Then once you're back in the main trunk, write towards hitting that next set of choices. And whenever you've hit a line of dialogue or choice or entire scene that will be affected by one of those previous choices, just go back to that scene and add a variable in order to track it. Uh, we don't always strictly follow these rules. Sometimes we really do have really long branches. Sometimes we have choices that only appear off other choices. Sometimes we have fake choices where there's one good option. Just use them sparingly 
save them for times where that really matters or you have no other choice for the sake of your players getting to see the best content and also just for the sake of you not wasting time writing things that no one will see. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on this part because I'm not the artist and this is more writer's field than mine, but it's also a huge part of our philosophy and I think like the character sprite direction is really important to making the player feel like they're part of the story. Visual novels are fundamentally about conversations with characters and it's important to make sure those characters feel expressive. Uh, characters absolutely must change expression on every single line no matter what. Absolutely no matter what. It doesn't have to be a big change but you have to do it. Uh, in analog we had about a hundred different expressions for character, Lady Killer is around the same. Um, I'm going to run some footage of Lady Killer that sort of demonstrates this. Uh, if it makes sense, you can even break up a line into two in order to fit, you know, having um, expressions change. Um, okay, I'm running a bit behind, so I'm going to rush through um, this next bit. I'm going to jump straight ahead uh, into talking a little bit about um, how we um, actually do writing of the script. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so visualizing your script. This is something we've learned the most from over the years. Uh, it's the thing we've had the most problems with. Visual novels are about interactions. But the way your game is presented to the players is what they're interacting with. Uh, it's very easy when you're working on a log project to lose sight of that and get tunnel vision. If your experience comes with prose or comics or other media like that, what you write is what your audience will see. But that's not the case for games like visual novels. Um, so basically, do your UI first. Uh, it, this might sound backwards, but trust me. You need to see what your player is going to see. It really matters, and you need to be able to keep that in mind while you're writing. Uh, even things like the fonts you choose, the information conveyed on the screen, the way choices appear, these have an impact on the way players approach things and need to understand them. For instance, text box size will have an impact on the cadence of your writing. The number of characters appearing on screen will affect the mood of your, of your scenes. The way choices are visualized will have an impact on what information you can convey with them. Uh, so another thing is, sorry, skipping through, um, we put together, a, we had a big problem in development. Um, I'm, generally, a lot of designers use flowcharts. Um, they're really useful if you're not using them. You should be. If you are using flowcharts, though, make sure they're the right tool. Flowcharts are really good at broad strokes for tracking the overall flow of the story, but they're probably not very useful on a per scene basis. Uh, in the past, we just sort of like wrote directly into the Reprise script format using basic text editor. It worked. It was great. For Lady Killer, we tried that, um, and the approach that worked fine for analog didn't work for Lady Killer's choice system at all. Um, so what we ended up doing was we created a special script editor. Um, the code for this is garbage. I wouldn't want anyone to use it. It was hacked together in two weeks, crashes all the time, but it's a really helpful visualization of how each choice branches outwards. With it, it became really easy to tell if one branch was getting too long or if branches of branches were getting out of control. And I could read the scene as a series of vertical slices. In plain script format, it would just be a disaster. Uh, just make sure you decide what visualization techniques make it easier to understand the structure of what you're writing as you write it and integrate them into your process. Um, again, I'm sorry, I'm skipping through an entire thing here. Um, What's really important is uh, make sure you're being smart and effective with your development time. If you know what your game looks like early on, you can iterate quickly rather than having to spend a lot of time making big changes later. If you understand your structure at a glance, you don't have to waste time every time you sit down to write. If you write most of your big choices, your choice branches economically, then you can spend the time you save making the big ones count. Um, you can't effectively implement parts of your script unless you understand the choice that came to them, so make sure you do. 
if you're flexible with your choices, you might find that by forcing yourself to accommodate different player approaches, you've actually made your story more interesting. Uh, in summary, the player interaction is your base unit, so build your story around them and make every major action the protagonist takes feels like there's a choice behind it. Have your characters change expressions on every line so conversations feel active rather than passive. Understand your script and understand the lens through which your player will be experiencing it. I know I've rambled here a little bit today, but I hope I've important at least some sort of coherent philosophy, at least a little bit, about visual novel design. What we've learned is that to make a good visual novel, you have to think about how the player is interacting with your story. No matter how big a story you want to tell is, what's really keeping your players going is the minute-to-minute -minute experience of playing the game. Understand what they're seeing, make characters feel like they have life to them, and regularly offer up to the player the chance to interact with the story in a way that feels meaningful. And if you do all that, they'll feel like they're a part of the story. Uh, that's pretty much the most important thing I've learned over these past five years. Thank you, and sorry for going over time. You're perfectly all right. We put padding in this just for this. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to um, direct you for I'll send you a link to Discord in case you're not on it because a lot of people are kind of just excited and asking questions, and that's where the chat's happening. Yeah, um, I'm in there now. I'll jump in. and I'll start. Um, sure. Um, yeah, I can just read off questions. Um, but but um, we're not being uh, like. Will not being able to design a UI first be a disaster? Like if you can't, for example. Um, it's not a disaster, but it will just mean that you don't necessarily understand what the player. I'd at least think about it very hard. Like even if you're just like start with sketches for sure, but I would try to have a good idea before you do too much writing. You can start writing, but like if you're more than like a quarter of the way in and you still don't know what it looks like. Uh, you're probably going to waste your own time. Right. I mean, it doesn't have to look pretty for these things. You can wireframe it, right, and have a, someone, an artist actually make it pretty later. I actually do think making it look pretty, like, really matters because, like, that's a part of the presentation. Like, I think you True. should understand what the player is going to see. Um, this, right. is, this, this won't work with everyone's process, but, again, like, I think the thing about rules is, like, know why you're breaking them. But that's something that I would always do is make sure I know what it looks like. Right. Uh, so, question, Christine, does the same dev team work on Lady Kill, both Lady Killer and Analog? They seem to have distinctly different styles. Uh, if so, what do you say to devs that want to innovate and improve but keep falling into the same old development techniques? Um, it was the same team for, for all three. We brought in like a couple extra people on art for Lady Killer just because it's so much bigger. Um, Jake, who was on earlier, did some of the backgrounds, for instance. but. Uh, it was by and large the same team, and I think part of what makes a really big difference is just ask your team members who like ask them for input too. Like, if 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 you've been working with the same people, um, probably everyone has their own ideas. Let someone else like take charge. Um, the original concept for Analog was all mine, but the original concept for Lady Killer was all Ride's, and um, it sort of got interesting just turning into like, how do I interpret this idea? So, you know, if you have people that you collaborate really well with, uh, like, let it turn into a conversation. Uh, okay, so we got enough time for maybe one more question here. Um, someone, Stephanie, was intrigued by how Lady Killer in a Bind revealed a bit more information and background to the world of your other VNs, such as Analog. Um, so was this timeline of that universe something you planned a long time, or is it something that just came up as you went along? Oh, this is definitely just like all completely ad hoc on the fly. I think, um, you know, in jokes are fun. If you have, if you do have an audience that's following you from game to game, uh, throwing a wink is always fun. Um, I really like, you know, like really gratuitous continuity porn. So this is just an excuse, you know, have fun with that. Uh, like there's definitely, you know, some weird swerves that I think will surprise players in my previous game, and like hidden in the epilogues. So you can have things that like most players won't get, that most players won't see, if you know, like if it's a reward for something, if you think that's you know something that's a cool thing to throw for people who have been with you for a long time. Cool. And this is exactly the point where we're going to be switching over to PyTom. Thank you very much for speaking, Christine. We can, can just continue the conversation in chat, but.